Today we're continuing our little study on love. We have looked so far at the most important thing in the world, which is God loves you. You. Not just you as a group, you as a, but you. You individually, God loves you so much. So much that he sent his son to die for you. I mean, it's incredible. And that love does not wane at all. It does not diminish at all. Even when we do the dumbest things in the world, God still loves us unconditionally, doesn't he? There's hope in that. There's power in that. There's peace in that, isn't there? He loves us so much. And, obviously, we love him, right? <laughs> and we looked at why, and let's make sure we always understand that point. We don't love him because he does stuff for us. We don't love him because he died for us, because he gives us things and things like that, because Satan can use that, can't he? When we don't feel like we're getting enough from him or getting things that we think we should get from him, sometimes our love can be diminished. We should always love him because of who he, what, is. And that doesn't change. He doesn't change at all. If you always remember who God is and love him for who he is, then your love will be strong, right? No matter what's going on in your life. And as far as how, there are many ways we can show our love to him by serving him, <coughs> by spending time with him, and obeying him and subjecting ourselves to his rules, reminding ourselves that he gives those to us because he what? Loves us. So these are ways that we can do. But now we're going to go, and frankly it does get a little harder from here on out. <laughs> <laughs> How many would say it's easy to love a God who's perfect? Obviously, right? You know, one who loves us so much and never, I mean, so, but now we're going to get into a little harder. Each week is going to get a little harder. I liken it unto somebody one day gives you a $500,000 house. How many would take it? Yes, <laughs> it would be very nice, right? A nice $500,000, it's got a nice piece of property, it's sturdy, it's good looking, and stuff like that. And all he says is, well, you got to clean it. Is that okay? Yeah, that makes sense. Give me the house, I should be able to clean it. Well, today we're going to get into the category of, oh yeah, you got to maintain it. <laughs> <laughs> you may have to paint it every once in a while. You may have to fix a few things. And it's going to get harder. <laughs> right? We're given a great gift, but there's a lot that goes into it, isn't it? And today we're going to look at one group that we are supposed to love, and that is, let's say it together, one another. Look around. <laughs> it's those people. Those people. And not just the ones here. All of those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Doesn't matter where they live, doesn't matter what they're doing, <laughs> doesn't matter what uh, group they're associated with, <laughs> it doesn't matter uh, any of that. It's, we love them. Should we love the Christians in Ukraine who are going through a very difficult time right now? Yeah. Should we love the Christians in India who are going through a lot of persecution right now? Yes. Should we love the Christians in Australia? Well, you've never, never met. <laughs> you, don't, you don't know them at all, but do you love them? Because we are all the body of Christ. We are all in this together, and we are to love one another. In fact, let's look at what Jesus says in 1 John chapter 3. You say, why do you say it that way? Isn't this written by John? But no. <laughs> John was there when Jesus had communion, that first communion with his disciples, and explain what the bread and the wine were for. And also during that entire time, as we're going to see, he kept hammering on his disciples that you need to what? Love one another. That was so important and ingrained into the mind of John that as John is writing these letters to his church, and he's the last, He's the last of the disciples. He lived the longest. His ministry went the longest. And here he's going to write three letters, and he's writing them to the church. And what do you think the number one topic he talks about? Love. <laughs> God's love for us, our love for God, and love for who? One another. And here in 1 John chapter 3, verse 23, he writes, And this is his commandment. Now, keep in mind, for us to love God, we should keep his commandments, right? This is one of his commandments that he heard straight from Jesus' mouth. That we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ. 
Must do that in order to be saved, right? That's his commandment. And love one another as he gave us what? Commandment. He says commandment twice. This is the commandment of God that we love one another. And if we love God, we can show that love to him by what? Loving one another. This is what we need to do. So I want you to kind of set your mind who we're talking about today. These are other Christians. Others who have proclaimed their faith in Jesus Christ, who's died for them, and they are children of God. That is who we are to love today. And we're going to start with our two questions. Why? You say, yeah, why? <laughs> you don't know some of the Christians I know. Well, why, why, why should I love them? And then, of course, we're also going to go to the how. How should we love one another? Okay? So we're going to start with the why. And again, let's go to 1 John. You're there already. And let's jump over to chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. And one of the things John, by the way, does throughout, especially this 1 John, is he wants to root out lies. He wants to make sure people aren't lying to themselves, <laughs> lying to others, that they're sincere in their walk with the Lord. And he says here in verse 20 of chapter 4, If a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, that's not your physical brother. This is your Christian brother or sister. He is a what? Liar. Was he lying about? That he hates his brother? No. <laughs> He's not lying about that. Was he lying? He's lying about the fact that he truly, sincerely loves God. Now keep in mind, he uses strong language here. He's not saying God doesn't love you anymore. He's not saying you don't actually love God. But are you demonstrating love for God and hate your brother or sister? You're lying about your relationship. For he that loves not his brother or sister in Christ, whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, from his mouth, that he who loves God loves his brother also. So the first why is because it demonstrates our love for who? For God. It's kind of like when God said, hey, I want you to work in your job, and I want you to give honor to your boss and do everything they tell you to do because you are really serving who? Serving God. So we can, when we love our brother or sister in Christ, no matter what they do, no matter the things that they say and all the terrible things they do, because can Christians be terrible? Don't look at anybody in particular now. No, no, that's like, yeah, <laughs> that guy, geez. No, no, we, we, how many are human beings? How many Christians are human beings? <laughs> all of them. How many of them still have a sin nature? All of them. How many still live in the flesh and fight against it every day? All of them. So we're going we're gonna to hurt each other sometimes. We're going to do bad things to each other. And what does he say, though? You are doing it for who? I love you not because of what you do, not because of that, because I love who? I love God, therefore I will love you. Right? And he says something interesting there where he says, how can you hate the one you see and say you love the one you don't? Well, let's face it, I think that is easier. I don't know where John's going with that argument. Because how many agree it's easier to love somebody you never see? <laughs> right. But that's the point, isn't it? can't say you love God, and then the people he puts into your life, the people he loves, the people that he has brought into your path to love, say, oh, I love you, but I don't like them. He says, can't, that can't happen that way. To love God is to what? Love the brother. So why? Because it demonstrates our love for God. Because we what? Because we love God. That's why we love the brother, right? Let's go to the next one. Chapter 4 still. Let's jump back, though, to verses 7 and 8. This is so hard to do without singing. <laughs> it's one of those great songs you sing that even has the, the reference point in the song. So it's an easy memory verse, right? We won't sing. I've done enough singing today off key. So <laughs> First John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love's, love is from whom? Of God. 
And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Verse 12, no man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us, and his love is perfected in us. So he's saying here, hey, to know God, to really have a relationship with God, to really understand God is to love who? Brother, brothers and sisters. So loving one another brings us close to who? To whom? Close to God. The more we love one another, the more we understand, first of all, God's patience, <laughs> God's understanding, God's forgiveness, his love. We understand that, but we also understand what he's doing in other people's lives, too. You know, in the medieval times, it was a big thing to be a hermit. The most religious people were hermits. I never understood that concept. <laughs> the most religious people were the ones who went out in the middle of nowhere and stayed away from everybody else and did weird things. Now, those were the great religious people. But was that God's plan? We get saved and then just go out in the wilderness and do our thing. No. It is not good for man to be alone. <laughs> His plan was us for us to come together, learn to love one another, and then when we do that, as Christians, we grow closer to whom? God. To God. And we can see one another, and know one another, and help one another, and that's God's plan, is that we work together and love together, and therefore grow closer to him. And then finally, John 13, 35. So not 1 John, but let's go back to John. John 13, verse 35. And again, this is when Jesus is, during that Passover, explaining to them how he's going to leave them, but what they need to do is love one another. And in verse 35, he gives a big why. Let's start, jump back to verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, this kind of love for one another, all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. So not only is this important for us and our relationship with God, that we love one another. Who else is this important to? All those people out there. <laughs> all those people that aren't part of the family, right? How many of you have ever said a, just spent some time with a family and said, man, I'd like to know that family. I'd like to be part of that family. I'd like to spend time with them. They're just so nice to each other, and they're so welcoming, and they're so great. How many have ever seen a family and said, boy, I can't get away from that family fast enough. <laughs> All I do is fight and argue the whole time. It's just horrible. I would hate to be in that household. How many? Are we a witness by the way we treat one another? Let's face it. Is there enough splintering and division and hatred and arguing and fighting out there? Is there enough of it out there? I'm just talking Congress. I'm talking everywhere. <laughs> everywhere there's this division, right? And what is, what can we offer the world? A better way. A better way of living, a better way of getting along. You realize how amazing the church is? See, before Christ, those who knew God were all basically of the same family, right? Israelites, right? Jews, right? He's got, and they should have gotten along, did they? No, they found every which way to split up as well. <laughs> so, but let's think about that. After Christ, when his church started, we're made up of people from where? All different backgrounds. Again, just look around this room. <laughs> How many different nations are represented? How many different cultures are represented? How many different languages are represented in this little tiny church in Annandale? How many different backgrounds, education levels, jobs, and everything else, where you grow up, how you say y'all, and things like that, some weird things. Age groups, how different are we? And if we can truly be that melting pot, <laughs> right, that I keep talking about in the United States, if we can truly be ones who can set aside any differences and say, I am here because I love who? Love God. And I want us to come together and be close to God. 
and let's work together. What kind of witness, what kind of light would that be to the rest of the world? It'd be amazing, wouldn't it? And he says, by this they will know that you are my, what? Disciples. Converse is true. If we're constantly backbiting each other and fighting each other, the Bible also says that we are a terrible witness. Because <laughs> the world will look at it and say, I, I got that at home, right? I got that in my workplace. I've got that in my life. I don't need more of that. But if we truly love one another, what a witness we would be, right? And it's a witness. And again, a witness to who? A witness to God. So, when it comes down to the big question, as always, why should we love one another? Is it because of what they can do for me? No. Is it because they do this, this, or this, and I like it? No. Is it because they don't do this and this, and I don't like that? No, it's not, it has nothing to do with what the person does. It's because of who they what? Are. They are sinners who, by the grace and mercy and patience and love of God, like you, are a child of God. We're family. And because of that, of who we are in God, we should what? Love one another. So here's the test. I want you to just turn to somebody and say, I love you. Go ahead, do it. <laughs> hey, pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> I love you too and I, and I will say this from all of my heart I love every single one of you I, I'm not joking about it I, I have loved every, any, every kid who's come to this church every person who's ever come to this church I love them and I would do anything for them I would do anything for you, we love you. thank you I appreciate that and that's and again, it's not because of what you do for me or I get this or I <laughs> it's because of who you are. You're my brothers and my sisters. And that means something, doesn't it? And our Father is who? God, who loves us so much. So, why should we love one another? Because of who we are. We are children, and in doing so, we show our love for God, we get closer to God, and we are a better witness in this world. Is that good reasons to do it? Okay, let's get to the how then. Because <laughs> then it gets a little harder, right? Well, how do I love one another? Wasn't that enough? How many said they love somebody somebody? That's enough, isn't it? Come on. <laughs> I don't have to go beyond that, do I? Well, the answer is yes. In fact, we're there at John. Let's go to John chapter 13. We read it. Verse 34. How? A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another. Here we go, folks. As I have loved you. Who? What now? I want you to love one another like Jesus loved his disciples. And just in case maybe he was just making things up there, maybe got a little wrong, let's go to chapter 15, verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. <laughs> Can it get any clearer? How much did Jesus, how did Jesus, remember we, we looked at what would Jesus do, right? How did Jesus love his disciples? Were his disciples at times frustrating? Stupid. <laughs> did they abandon him in the garden? Did one of them deny him three times? Did they do things that made him angry? Did they do things that irritated him? Were they always helpful? <laughs> no. Yet, what did Jesus do? Did he love them anyways? How much? He died for them. Died for them. Spent time with them. Taught them. Was patient with them. Right? That's the same way we ought to love one another. Not because the other person just never gets on our nerves and I just have a great time whenever I'm with them. Because you find somebody like that, good luck. <laughs> and just wait about an hour. <laughs> Something's coming along. So how? Like God, like Jesus loved his disciples, that what we used to do. But let's get more specific than that, okay? Let's look at five ways in particular we can love one another, okay? Hebrews chapter 10. A couple of these will be very much like what we can do to show our love to God. <laughs> so these are... These are love languages throughout the ages. 
Things we can do to show we love somebody. The first one is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. <coughs> or, sorry, verse 24. Hebrews 10, 24. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. So we're supposed to help each other, right? That's part of love is to help each other be better at loving, loving God, loving one another, and also doing the works of God. Verse 25, here's the important part we're going to look at right now. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, encouraging one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, the time of Christ coming, the more and more we should be getting together, and here's it is, we need to spend time, right? That's what you're doing today. Spending time with one another. Is this the only time you can spend time with one another? No. You can go out to lunch, spend time during the week, help each other with stuff. <laughs> you know, help each other along the way. But spending, is spending time important? You know, and I know a lot of Christians, a lot of Christians are like, oh, you know, uh, church, you know, I go because I get something out of it. I, I, if I'm not getting anything out of it, why would I go? Well, that's not the point. Do you realize the purpose of you coming to church is so some, somebody gets something out of you? It's like, well, I'm not up there preaching. That doesn't matter. <laughs> How many talked to somebody today? <laughs> In talking to them, you gave them something. You gave them your time. You gave them attention. You heard something about them, right? Just coming today, you learned that Matthew's in the hospital. Is that important? To know what people are going through, to know some struggles they're going through, to also know like Bob's doing very well, that Sharon's doing so much better, that Mr. Mercado's surgery went well, that we can praise and together. And again, this was such a foreign concept. This idea that we would be getting together weekly like this. People of all different backgrounds, all different genders, all different positions in life, all coming together for the purpose of just being together. <laughs> and this is started with the first church. The first church, what did they do actually every day? Every day they'd come and hear the teaching and sing together and pray together and eat together so that they would know each other. That's how you get to know each other is by spending time with one another, right? And so you need to spend time together. You need to come together and have communion, right? Which we're going to have later on, but... <laughs> Communion's all the time. When we come together, we have that conversation and that work together. So, yes, yeah, spend time together. What's another thing we can do? Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 1. Again, this is Paul writing to the church in Philippi, a group of Christians that are to love one another. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of what? Love. If any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies fulfill you my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife, or vainglory, out of selfishness, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. How many have problems? No, don't have to raise your hand. You all got them. <laughs> How many got issues, things going on in your life right now? We've all got them, right? Is it easy just to focus on those? Yeah, because those are mine, right? I've got to deal with them. I've got to... What does he say there? Don't just think on your own things, but also on the things of other. And he's basically saying you need to serve others. And I find this is so true. And I've done this experiment before. Everybody take your hand. Not somebody else's hand. Take your hand. I want you to put it right in front of your face. Right in front of your eyes. What do you see? Your hand. <laughs> and if these are your problems, these right here are your problems, and you put them right there, what do you see? Problems, problems, problems. problems. But if I take my hand and I move it out here, 
What do I see? I see this, but I also see what? I see everything else. I move. If I'm constantly just focused on my problems, my problems, my problems, what I need, what I need, what I need, you will be a miserable person. But if you not just think about your own, but also think on the other, it's like, well, that's just what I need. I need more depressing stuff. <laughs> no, that's not the way it works. Because as you think about other people, as you see God work in other people's lives, as you, as you help other people's, yours just keep getting what? Further and further in the distance and become smaller and smaller and smaller. You say, well, wait a minute. Who's going to take care of my needs then? Well, God and those what? Other people. Because here's a little experiment. If you are the only person worrying about your problems in this room, how many people are worrying about your problems in this room? One. <laughs> if everybody just came in today and said, I'm just going to worry about my problems, you, one person is worrying about your problems. But if everybody's worrying about everybody's problems, how many people are worrying about your problems? A whole bunch of people. <laughs> Isn't that nice? We're in this together. This life. We're in this together. And God made this purpose. He knew that, yes, he physically would be in heaven, right? He separated from us spiritually. But what? Physically, I mean. Physically, he separated from us, so he put what? People here to be his hands and feet, the mouths, to, just to give a hug, say hi to, help out painting a room or moving something, whatever we need to help one another, right? That's the whole purpose of this. So we need to what? To show our love, we need to serve one another. Know what's going on, even if it's praying for them or just talking to them. We're not talking, you got to solve everybody's problems. But can you help? Can you pray? Can you do what you can? Yes. So it, it requires us to serve one another, spend time with one another, serve one another. And by the way, the more you spend time with people, the more you're able to serve. <laughs> it's kind of hard to be separate and help out much, right? But you can. So serve others. What else we need to do? Let's go back to 1 John. John's got a lot to say about all this stuff. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16. 1 John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Well, okay, let's, let's get back to that issue, right? Love like God loved, right? Okay, what did God do? Because he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. <laughs> sure. I'll say it right now. I'm happy to die for any of you. Sure. <laughs> Let's do that. A gunman comes in, I'm going to throw myself on him, and I will die for you. Does it make you feel better? Make you feel loved? Oh, yeah. What are the odds of that happening? <laughs> Very slim. <laughs> So he goes further. I like John. <laughs> He's not going to let us get away with that and say, well, God died for people, so I'll love them by dying for them if that ever happens to come up. But it's more than that, isn't it? Look what it says. But whoso has this world's good, and we have this world's good. We have money. We have things. We've got coats. We've got beds, we got <laughs> houses, we, 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 we got the world's goods. And you notice how you describe this world stuff, right? Who gave you those things? God. Well, God gave them to you. And sees his brother have need and shuts up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and what? Truth. Truth. So, yeah, I'll die for you, but I'm not going to lend you my car. <laughs> I'm not going to let you come over to my house. I'm not going to give you a meal. I'm not going to come help you move something. I mean, that's ridiculous. I'll die for you, though. What does he say? That's not indeed in truth, is it? Indeed in truth says what? You need something, you got it. If God has blessed me with it, then what? Share it. <laughs> right? We sacrifice for one another, right? And again, what's that idea that comes in your head? But if I give it to them, then I won't have. Well, if you don't have a need, who's going to be there to help you? But then I have to tell people I have a need. Vulnerability is the problem. <laughs> How many like to be vulnerable? How many like to say, I need help? Those words don't come off the mouth easy, do they? I need your help. 
I don't have something and I need your help. It's hard to say. Pride gets in the way. How much does pride get in the way of our walk with God? <laughs> All the time. This is part of it. If somebody has a need, I will give, and then I've got to turn around. If I have a need, I have to what? Ask. And will God provide? Will there be somebody else there to help me? Absolutely. That's the way this works. That's the way the early church worked, wasn't it? What was one of the things the early church did? Everybody gave what they had, and then they gave it to other people. You have to remember, when the church came on, all those Jews getting saved, they lost everything. Some of them lost their houses, their families, their inheritance, their jobs, their positions. I mean, they, they lost everything. Where could they go? Welfare department? No. Go to the Roman government and say, hey, I just lost everything because I'm a Christian. Can you help? No. <laughs> Where did they go? They went to the church, and the church was what? Well, if you have need here, you know, he gave, sold his property and gave the money to us so we can help you. We can give you some food and give you a place to stay and things like that. That's what they did. And did people take notice? Yes. People took notice of how they treated each other and they came to the church too. <laughs> to know God. That's the light, right? That witness. Because they were willing to sacrifice for one another and help each other and give for one another. All right, those are practical things we can do, but let's also look at attitude. Okay, let's go to Ephesians chapter 4. How can we have the right attitude of love toward one another? Ephesians chapter 4. Starting in verse 1. I, Paul, write to the church in Ephesus, therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation, the job, wherewith you are called. Our job is to love one another. <laughs> Our job is to help one another, isn't it? With what? With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, patience. Forbearing one another in what? Love. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling, etc., etc., etc. One Lord, one faith, one hope, right? All of those things. And he says here what? We need to, what kind of attitude should we have? Humble love. Again, as human beings, it's easy to say what? I'm better than you. I love you. <laughs> I will pity you with my love. Right? We can be like the Pharisees, right? Oh, I love that poor person, and I'm so glad I'm not like them. Right? Is that, that, or judgy, right? Oh, I love them, that poor, poor, terrible person. Right? That, that sinner. Oh, I, I love them, but boy, they're horrible. Is that, is, that, is that, did you read any of that? <laughs> Instead, it's a what? It's a love of forbearance, patience, humility, of this is who? This is a child of God. They may be struggling. They may be having a hard time. I love them. Not out of pity. Not out of arrogance. Not I'm better than them, so I will deign to help them, but instead of, I am a fellow Christian, saved by the grace of God just like you are. A lot of my own struggles too, right? And let's be honest, we all have our struggles, so let's help one another. And I love you as equals. Which again, what a foreign concept, right? <laughs> the church brings in this world. Doesn't matter who you are. We are all what? Brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are to love with a humble love, right? And then also with what? 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Last place we're going today. <clears throat> 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. And Peter writes... Seeing you have purified your souls and obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love another with a heart fervently. 
bottom line, sincerely, <laughs> unfeigned, unpretending, let's love sincerely, right? Again, in deed and truth, right? Not just saying it, not just saying, well, you know, Dad told me to love you, <laughs> right? But truly love one another, care about them, care about what's going on in their life, care about what they're going through. And in humility, reach out to them and say, how can I help? I love you. Even people we don't know, can we still love them in that way? As we get to know them more, love them even more, right? In fact, you'll see a little thing on the bottom that says the keys. And to me, the keys are here is to get to know each other and have compassion. It's easy to judge. It's easy to look down. It's easy, but we got... What, if, what are people going through? How many agree life is hard? Life is hard. Who here is going through stuff? <laughs> going through stuff. Look at each other. Spend time with one another. Get to know each other with a heart of understanding, a heart of compassion, a heart of sympathy, and one that says, I love you. Let me help you get through this life. Right? And they will do the same for you. And that's the kind of love that gets us through this life. Yes. Is God there for us? Yes. Is the shepherd there for us? Yes. But who does he use? <laughs> he uses one another. So let's love one another, no matter who we are, no matter what we say to each other, no matter what we do to each other. Let us le learn to love one another, be patient with one another, forgiving of one another, putting up with one another. That's another word for forbearance. <laughs> Because let's get let's uh, and show love to one another. That's the commandment of God. Okay.